Those that like to uh, stand and join us in the Lord's Prayer and Pledge of Allegiance, please do. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy kingdom come. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're convening the September 20th, 2016 uh, legislative <coughs> session for the Wicomico County Council. Uh, first item on the agenda is to approve the uh, legislative minutes from September 6, 2016. Entertain so a motion to approve. So moved. Uh, second. Second. Any corrections? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Minutes are approved. Entertain a motion to approve the open work session minutes from August 16th in reference to the comprehensive plan, Chapter 6. So moved. Second. second. Any corrections? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Minutes are approved. Entertain a motion to approve the open work session minutes from August 16th, in reference to priority funding. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion or corrections? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Minutes are approved. Entertain a motion to approve the open work session minutes from September 6, 2016, in reference to development impact fees. So moved. Second. Second. Any corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Minutes are approved. Entertain a motion to approve the open work session minutes from September 6, 2016, the legislative breakfast discussion. So moved. Second. Second. Any corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Minutes are approved. Mr. President. Yes, sir. I don't know uh, if it's just me or not, but it, it's hard to hear you. Okay. I'll, I'll speak up. That help? Okay, thanks. Uh, at this point in time, we have a, a proclamation that uh, Vice President Holloway is going to present with Mr. to Mr. Dave Ryan of Salisbury Wicomico Economic Development. Good morning, Dave. How are you? Good morning. Good. How are you? Great. Mr. Ryan, if you would. How are you? I'm good. Good. <clears throat> this is a proclamation. Whereas Salisbury Wicomico Economic Development is an active member of the Maryland Economic Development Association, a nonprofit organization established in 1968 whose mission is to enhance the socioeconomic environment of Salisbury, Wicomico County, and region throughout the preservation and creation of productive employment opportunities. And whereas META members promote the economic well-being of Maryland by working to improve the state's business climate and the professionalism of those in the field of economic development, including other professionals, with an interest in the economy of Maryland, and through its regular meetings, special programs, and projects, members address diverse issues. And whereas the economic growth and stability of the state affects all regions and jurisdictions of Maryland, and Salisbury, Wicomico Economic Development, and Wicomico County is an important component of the state's economic success. Now, therefore, the Wicomico County Executive, in conjunction with the Wicomico County Council, hereby proclaim the week of September 19th through 24th, 2016, as Economic Development Week, signed by the County Executive and all the County Council. Holloway and uh, Mr. Kramer, you remember years ago the old Maryland Industrial Development Association. We went to uh, the, the, you took me to the first meeting and, and it introduced me around. Uh, over the years, we've established great partnerships through that organization. We enjoy, we're we're happy to join uh, Governor Hogan and the entire Maryland team for this Economic Development Week. It's every, it's Economic Development Day every day in Wicomico County. We know we're only as good as the partnerships we keep and the relationships we strengthen. So. Thank the County Executive Culver and the entire Wicomico County Council for, for their continued support. Thank you, Mr. Dave, we'll have you in a work session, I guess, next month, right? 
to report some things? Uh, hopefully a couple. Good. Good. Okay. Great. Uh, we also have a, a second proclamation for National Recovery Month. Uh, Councilman uh, Mark Kilmer will be presenting this proclamation. Ms. Cynthia Schiffler. As uh, President Cannon said, this is a proclamation for uh, National Recovery Month. Uh, whereas mental and or substance use disorders affect all communities nationwide, but with commitment and support, people with these disorders can achieve healthy lifestyles and lead rewarding lives in recovery. By seeking help, people who experience mental and or substance use disorders can embark on a new path toward improved health and overall wellness. The focus of National Recovery Month this September is to celebrate their journey with the theme, Join the Voices for Recovery, Our Families, Our Stories, Our Recovery. Recovery Month spreads the message that behavioral health is essential to health and one's overall wellness and that preservation works, treatment is effective, and people recover. And whereas the impact of mental and or substance use disorders is apparent in our local community, and an estimated 23 million Americans in the United States are affected by these conditions. Through Recovery Month, people become more aware and are able to recognize the signs of mental and or substance use disorders, which can lead more people into the needed treatment. Managing the effects of these conditions can help people achieve healthy lifestyles, both physically and emotionally. Whereas the, the Recovery Month observance continues to work to improve the lives of those affected by mental and or substance use disorders by raising awareness of these diseases and educating communities about the prevention, treatment, and recovery were resources that are available. For the above reasons, we are asking the citizens to join us in celebrating this September as National Recovery <coughs> Month. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Executive and my Comico County Council do hereby proclaim the month of September 2016 as National Recovery Month in Salisbury, Maryland, and call upon our community to observe this month with compelling programs and events that support this year's observance, signed by the County Executive and the County Council. Thank you. introduce uh, to Keisha Collins. She's our opioid misuse prevention program coordinator. So we have an additional person now working Great. on this issue. Um, plus it's very timely this week because the White House just announced this as opioid and heroin epidemic week. So because of the issue around the country, not just here in Wicomico County, and not just in Maryland, but all around the country. So thank you all so much for your support. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Kramer. Morning, Mr. President, members of the County Council, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before moving on with the agenda, I'd like to address, uh, with Council's permission, two housekeeping items. Um, you have received draft copies of two letters. One is a draft letter supporting the Triton program at uh, Wallops Island for its uh, economic development potential on the eastern shore of Virginia and including Wicomico County and hopefully our Salisbury Ocean City Wicomico County Regional Airport. If there is a con council consensus, uh, a copy of that letter will be available for your signature before you leave today. The is second that, item. Is that okay with? Council members. Okay. Thank you. The second item is also a letter of support uh, for Governor Hogan's uh, proposed bill for uh, additional funding to the small community college uh, support program. This, uh, I don't think I need to go over the details because you're all familiar with uh, this effort on Governor Hogan's part to uh, level the playing field more for the funding of small community colleges uh, versus uh, uh, the level of funding uh, per, per pupil, that is, per student uh, uh, in the large counties. Okay. Is that okay with council members? Correct. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Thank you, Mr. President. Gentlemen, the next item for your consideration is a presentation from Wicomico Housing Authority, uh, Mr. Donnie Bibb, Executive Director. Mr. Bibb is here to give council members an update on uh, construction and renovation projects under underway with WCHA. Mr. Bibb. Good morning. your way through there. Mr. President, members of the council, thank you for this opportunity to update you on activities of the Housing Authority. Uh, as you are aware, we began construction on the Boot Street uh, Phase 1 project back in January of this year. 
proposed completion date is still December of this year. Uh, at this time, the first three buildings that butt to Booth Street itself are about 95% complete. I invite any of you, if you want an opportunity to tour those units, to contact my office and we'll certainly make up time and a personal uh, tour for you to see those. Um, we anticipate leasing to begin next week on these units. We've had a great deal of public interest uh, and calls on that. Uh, they have established a leasing office temporarily, which will be in the construction trailer beginning next week. Uh, the times for those uh, interview opportunities for people will be posted outside the door. Um, we do have a, a laundry list of people, to, needless to say, that have already submitted their addresses and phone numbers to be contacted. Uh, as you're aware, part of that process with the RAD deal is that 50 residents of the current Booth Street property are eligible to move back as part of the first 86 in phase one. Um, we are identifying with uh, the developer those individuals that will be qualifying moving back probably beginning the first week of November. Um, we expect to have 100% occupancy by June 30th of next year. Uh, depends on the eligibility requirements for those individuals who fall under the tax credit units. Um, the uh, scattered site, to give you an update on that, the board awarded contract last night for the beginning of the first 15 units on, uh, in Fruitland and Salisbury. Uh, the contract was $697,500 for those 15 units. The renovations are gonna be fairly uh, involved. We're talking about roofing, siding, windows, doors, um, bathrooms, kitchens, pretty much an interior gut, exterior renovation. Uh, the anticipated completion date is six months from today when the notice to proceed is being issued. And uh, we look forward to finally, after eight years, beginning to take the boards off those units and bringing back the face to the community. Um, I wanted to give you some, some numbers to follow so that you're clear and understand what we're, what we're facing here. Uh, obviously, the Housing Authority originally had 277 units in its portfolio of public housing. With removal of the first 50 units of Booth Street, it took it down to 227 units. Out of those 227, 52 are currently vacant, which includes the 39 boarded up units. The other 13 units are in ready-make position in order to, for us to occupy them within the next 60 days. We will continue as we renovate the units to bring people in off the wait list. As you know, that wait list has been fairly stagnated for a number of years. The Housing Authority owns 102 single-family homes, 90 of which are the scattered site units, 12 which are located on West Road. We've had discussion in the past, and I think this is a, an item that's gonna be moved forward in January, to convert those 12 single family homes into a homeownership opportunity. Uh, we'll be submitting an application to HUD for a disposition plan, which will take them off the public housing portfolio once that's happened. And we'll work with local organizations to help find home buyers. We'll also be looking at the current occupants to see if any of them are eligible to become homeowners of those units. So with that, we will be reducing down after the 90 units of uh, scattered sites, the 50 units from uh, phase one, and those 12 units, the portfolio for public housing will reduce probably almost 50%. Um, it is our anticipation moving forward uh, with doing other ventures in the community, such as providing some economic opportunity, uh, perhaps acquiring some expiring uh, 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 current tax credit projects that would give us an opportunity to move into uh, a more uh, private sector management operation. Um, I did have a question that was raised to us. Uh, we were awarded, and this is an annual ongoing award so that you understand. Total of $993,082 last year for our fiscal year. 
of that 993, $365,193 goes to the capital improvements. The focus over the past two and a half years of funding that we've had sitting there is going into the renovations of the scattered sites. Uh, there's various other line items such as uh, proration of administrative salaries to administer the program. Uh, we have management improvement items which are upgrades to the computer system, conference attendance, and the bulk of that money, about 240000 is actually hard capital improvement items. Um, I think that completes my presentation. Is there any questions? Um, the 12 houses, why, why, were, why were those chosen out of the rest of the houses, um, 12 that you're going to identify for sale? In the original portfolio for Booth Street, it actually consisted of 112 units. But because 100 of those are multifamily, they excluded those 12 single family units from the RAD deal. So they stand out there by themselves. And under HUD's regulation, I can't incorporate them into another AMP. That's what we call each project an AMP. So it makes it better sense to offer an opportunity for resale back to the public or to the community those single family homes that stand alone by themselves. Thank you. John. Don, you said the wait list was stagnant, uh, and, and what does that mean? Well, as we all know, the, the, the prior administration for years, when vacancies came up, they just boarded up the units. I see. Um, and that stagnates your wait list. Right. So by going through the effort of renovating these units, we'll be putting back online 39 units that have been unutilized for at least eight years. Good. Thank you. Larry? Yeah, um, Mr. Bibb, do you have a card so that we can contact you to take the tour? I will actually send uh, the information to Mr. Kramer, yes. and he can distribute it. We've seen a lot of changes over the years, and I, I think it's a, a massive improvement. You can see it from Route 50 uh, going by, and it, it looks great, and I hope it'll be an improvement for the area as well. I think you'll be thoroughly impressed once you go through there. The, the dramatic change, just standing on Booth Street and looking at the Phase 2 site and the Phase 1, mm -hmm. uh, it day. definitely adds to, to the fabric of the neighborhood. After those first 15 that he's going to renovate, how many more are you going to renovate? We, we have plans to renovate all 90 at, at various stages of, of renovation, obviously, because some have been renovated as recently as uh, maybe six years ago. But we are in the process of finalizing the RAD process with HUD for those 90 units of the scattered site. We expect to finalize a loan deal with Bank of Delmarva uh, within the next 75 days and close with HUD in January or February of next year on that. So by the time we're finishing up those first 15, we'll have funding in place to begin rolling forward to complete the rest of them. So with the 15, that'll leave you, what, 25 houses that are still boarded up? Correct. How long will they remain boarded up? If I can secure funding by January or February of next year, uh, we'll begin rolling right into those. Uh, I guess the question would be, too, um, I think it's part of what you touched on the last time you were here. Uh, I, as I understand it, you're changing uh, your maintenance structure as far as how the houses are maintained because this is, I mean, for, for almost half the houses to go into total disrepair and to be boarded up is pretty much unheard of. And then, then to have to turn around and spend almost $50,000 a house to repair these homes. That's so much money that's being wasted. We're talking millions of dollars that's being spent that could have been used towards other benefits. So I guess the question would be, um, what, uh, what, uh, what do you have in place now to assure that this same type of um, uh, problem won't exist again? We don't board up vacant units. When they become vacant and available for reoccupancy, we're in there maintaining the, the renovation work and getting them back online as quickly as possible. So there's a full staff now with, um, with the housing I still authority? have the three original maintenance staff over there. It's just a reorganization of their time and the focus from management that when it becomes vacant, it still has to be reoccupied. Mm -hmm. We don't board it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can't speak to my, my predecessor's uh, mindset or approach in doing business, but I made it very clear when I came before the council that the old policies are not the way of the new agency. Good. 
Okay. Any other? Larry? Thank you. All right, Mr. Pibb, we appreciate you coming in again, and uh, we'll, we'll be talking to you soon enough, I know. I'll look forward you, to it. You've requested that. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Take care. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a community-wide home buyer education seminar presentation by Allison Pulcher from the Salisbury Neighborhood Housing Services and Sarah Rain from Coastal Association of Realtors. Good morning. Good morning. Sure. Yeah, have a seat. Got Thank four you. chairs here. Oh, you're in. All right. Just let Thank the you. if you could announce no. on the mic who no. you are for the public. Oh, after you. My name is Allison Poulter and I'm with Salisbury Neighborhood Housing Services. Sarah Rain, Coastal Association of Realtors. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. So we are here this morning, which is actually a great counterpoint to the Housing Authority's presentation. Uh, our mission at Salisbury Neighborhood Housing is to encourage home ownership and financial success and stability. Um, and the Coastal Association of Realtors is certainly in the business of encouraging home ownership as well. We are partnering together. Um, CAR secured a pretty sizable grant, and we are putting on a ho community-wide home buyers education class. We've partnered with Rivers Edge. They will be our host. Home buyers education is a requirement for many lenders, especially for first-time home buyers um, or those with second-tier lenders. It is a certificate that is good for two years, and the class is typically $100. Um, this grant will secure that 25 families are able to take the class for free and receive the certificate. Um, so we will be presenting our traditional presentation of the class, but we will also incorporate local lending agencies, title companies, attorneys, uh, utility companies, movers, um, as well as uh, city public works, uh, everything involved in a home ownership process from pre-purchase to the purchase process itself to post-purchase and maintenance of the property. Good. Yeah, so we got $3,600 grant from the National Association of Realtors through their Housing Opportunity Program, which is designed to um, increase access to home ownership for low-income individuals. So um, they have several different levels of grants. We got a level two, which we could apply for up to 5,000. We applied for 3,600 and that's what we got. Good. So um, the hope is that this will, you know, $100 doesn't seem, sound like a lot of money, but it can be to a low income family trying to purchase a home. So just taking that wall down and making it a little bit easier for right. them. And we'll have uh, members of our association presenting, uh, as she said, including our, um, who's going to be our president, Don Bailey. And the idea is to have these professionals there so they have one-on-one -on -one time with them to get their questions answered. Um, we're gonna include lunch and breakfast and we'll have some giveaways for them as well as a couple of uh, door prizes that are some gift cards to, we talked about Home Depot and Lowe's and Ace Hardware to help them just a little bit more get what they need for their new home. We're really also using it as a, a touch point for those families that need a little bit more preening on their financial journey that maybe aren't quite there, but within the next quarter could be there. Taking this class gets them that certificate and then our, offices, our office offers our financial uh, counseling services for free. Um, so they will be able to come to us and get their own individualized financial journey to that end game of home ownership. Questions from? Yeah, I think. Uh, how are you? Um, how are you doing your outreach? Uh, so social media. Um, we did WMDT. We have both done press releases, um, present presenting here and word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So all of our clients are aware of it. All of the realtors and their clients are aware of it. Um, all the local agencies that deal in home in the home ownership process are aware of it. So we've had a really good turnout thus far. And we've actually we've filled twenty three of the slots. Twenty three of the twenty five. Really? So if we hit that twenty five mark, we will look at more um, grant funding to be able to open it up to even more families. Yes. Right. So anyone who is interested in it, we will open it up after twenty five to more. Good. Did you have a question there? No, I I just wanted to. Congratulate you on the new job. Um, 
I don't know how long you've been there, but I'm trying to think of the lady that was there before. I think Jackson was her last name. But, uh, talking to you. <laughs> oh, I've been I've been here for mm, a year, a little a year. over a year. Okay. Um, it was Clay Tarpley before me. Yeah, a lot of people don't know what you all do, but right. you offer low interest. We are. We um, we offer some non not necessarily by the book traditional funding, but we do look at that broader scheme of credit worthiness that your big bank don't always look at, um, and we really gear very specifically for what you need as a person to get to that end game of becoming a homeowner. I think this is a great combination. I'm We're really excited about it. Look forward to see y'all working together. Yeah, we're glad to see you taking the initiative and, <clears throat> and for uh, the National Association of Realtors for providing the funding to mm -hmm. make this happen. Beyond the $100, uh, you have so many people who just find this the whole entire process overwhelming. Right. And they absolutely do not know what the first step is, and they're not going to walk into a bank and say, where do I start? Because right. that's, you know, uh, so this sort of sets it all up for them. And We're hoping you, it's a non-intimidating way to sure. sort of get that information and that, that education that they need to really feel like they can be homeowners. It can be such an intimidating process, but it doesn't have to be. Right. We really hope that this sort of takes some of that intimidation out of the, yeah. out of the scenario. So that's a good, that's a good. It's a great so, effort. Um, it's sure. on Saturday, October 8th from 8.30 to 4.30. And if anyone watching wants to sign up, what's the phone number? Our office is Salisbury Neighborhood Housing Services, so you have to call us to register. The number is 410-543-4626. And you can ask for me if you'd like. My name is Allison. Okay. Any other questions? No? Great. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a good week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. That's all I have for now. All right, Mr. Kramer, thank you. Mr. Baker, good morning. Good morning, sir. Um, to encourage new residential development, stimulate job creation, and support growth. Can't hear you, Mr. Baker. Sorry. Mr. I can't hear you. If you get that thank mic up there, thanks. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Is that better? Thank you. Okay. Uh, to encourage new residential development, to stimulate job creation, and to support growth in the economy, uh, presenting Legislative Bill 2016-12 uh, for introduction, which is an act to amend Chapter 130 of the Wicomico County Code titled Development Impact Fees, deleting the chapter in its entirety. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Entertain a motion from Council to introduce Legislative Bill 2016-12. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Are we planning on having any public hearings on this at any time? That's what we would schedule, yes. So we're going to have another public hearing. I thought we were going to vote on it today. I was under the impression we were going to vote on it today. No, we do the introduction, then we do the public hearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a legislative bill, so you have to have a public hearing after you introduce right. it, and it would be the second meeting in October. Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay. Any other discussion? Yeah, I, I've had a lot of people contact me thinking this is a good way to stimulate the economy, to get um, people back to work in the building industry. And um, uh, I remember when we introduced the bill and it passed, um, a lot of people were against it then. Um, a lot of educators are, are supporting it, and there is some concern about education, but I just want to um, let everybody know that education is going to be funded. No matter how you look at it, schools are going to be funded. So. This may be a good thing, helping uh, the builders get back to work. Any other comments? I have a question. Sure. Is there any particular reason why it's come up now? I mean, is there a demand for houses to be built at this time? Well, I think the idea is to reduce the upfront costs of housing, to make it easier for uh, those in the construction industry to to build the houses in order to um, you know, create that incentive. Well, I, I got an email over the weekend, and I thought everybody got it from one of the builders. Um, considering the fact that this uh, sprinkler bill is putting a, a big dent in their, in, um, in their funding, I think this is going to help them uh, by doing away with the impact fee, and that, that way they'll be able to afford the um, sprinkler bill. Well, is, is part of the timing, I mean, we have a moratorium that lasts until December 31st, is that right? right. So basically, I think the timing of this particular bill is that the moratorium is going to run out December 31st. So if we 
we either need to pass a new moratorium or deal with this permanently. I think that's that's why the specific timing is right now, is what I understand. So. And it takes 60 days to go in effect. Mr. President, it might be timely that uh, if the public hearing is held the second meeting in October, as Mr. Um, Baker states, uh, the 60 days will expire just before the end of 2016. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Yeah, Ernie, I think, um, I mean, I know personally, I know people who are builders who are building in Sussex County because they just simply say there's, you know, there's fewer barriers in Sussex County. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to help, you know, create more of an incentive in Wicomico itself. We also lost one of our uh, suppliers a few months ago um, due to the fact that there was no building going on in the county. Delaware Lumber closed That's correct. due to lack of business. So, and I think there's a demand to put people back to work. I don't know how much of a demand there is for houses. Hopefully, um, if the prices go down, it'll improve the demand maybe a little bit. So that, that might be a good point. I figure if you go out and solicit and get jobs here, we have got a reason for yeah. the build of houses. If we get the jobs here, we have a good reason for bringing the houses. Yeah. Maybe it would. And building houses. Building create, houses, yeah. That'll create, create some jobs, building houses as well. Yeah. A lot of jobs. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the introduction of Legislative Bill 2016-12 say aye. 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 Opposed? Please. Motions carried. Legislative Bill 2016-12. Introduction passes. Is the second meeting in October acceptable for the public hearing? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. At this time, we open the floor for public comments. If you have any comments you'd like to make, uh, please come to the podium. Please state your name and address. Okay. Seeing none, that concludes. Yes. Yes, certainly. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Donnie Messick, uh, Vice President of Messick Home Improvements and Robert L. Messick, Inc. I just want to say a few words about you uh, considering repealing the impact fee. I'd like to thank you for doing that. Um, just a couple personal things as far as my company. Uh, back before the turn in the economy, mm -hmm and all the fees that were enacted on the developers and the builders, we employed 30, uh, 30 people. It's basically what we employed back before the turn. Now we employ 10. So, um, and also uh, as far as tax base, building the tax base, right now we have 60 lots in steeplechase um, that you're getting approximately $300 uh, and property tax. Now, if we improve those with homes, you're going to be getting approximately $3,000 in property tax coming in. So I just want to make those couple points. And again, I appreciate you looking at repealing that law. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning, President Shawnee. Good morning. Um, my name is Mary Ashanti, and I'm president of Wacomico County uh, NAACP. Um, to our president, uh, Cannon, members of the county council, and all those assembled, again, good morning. And um, I'm grateful to be here. And um, thank you all for a great meeting. Um, I actually understood what was going on, and you <laughs> asked great questions, so thank you for that. Um, September 27th is National Voter Registration Day uh, in the country. So we are encouraged uh, all organizations and whatever to register folks to vote. And you know that early voting is, is next month and we encourage people to, uh, to vote. Uh, another thing I wanna share with you, uh, cause Mr. Cannon has something to do with this. Uh, we on Saturday, uh, activated, we activated our youth council, and I want to thank you for that and all those folks that, that were at the last year uh, Freedom Fund Banquet. Um, that council would teach young people how to be leaders, um, how to be productive in the community. Um, we listen to what they're concerned about, 
Uh, one of the things that you're concerned about is the violence um, uh, in, throughout the country and in the community. Um, they're having some uneasiness about those kinds of things. Um, a little bit about gangs and schools and, and, and that type of thing, some things that they're concerned about. We listen to them, try to teach them ways to uh, solve problems in a productive manner. And if we're fortunate, we might can get them to attend a, a county council meeting or something like that when school is not in session. Um, the other thing is I want to thank you all for your support for our Freedom Fund Banquet, uh, which is um, February the, mm, I'm thinking I hear the heritage now, uh, October the 1st, 11.30 at First Baptist, and I know that you will bring greetings on me, behalf of the council. And we just want to thank you for you all for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you, President Shawnee. Any other public comments? Yes, sir. Actually here for another reason, but I heard a couple things today that I, I like. First off, the um, presentation from the Housing Authority. When I was on the council in Fruitland, we met with the Housing Authority on multiple occasions because I believe in Fruitland, if I'm not, not mistaken, there's 19 boarded houses in Fruitland, um, which was pretty disproportionate to the number of total number of boarded houses. And um, we understood that the funding was very low and, and looking out, it was realistic that they were going to stay boarded for some time. So. Uh, it's, it, it's good to hear that, that those houses, the boards might be coming off and people may occupy them. I mean, we, we even suggested maybe they sell some of those units so that take that funding and, and upgrade other houses and someone else could buy those houses and fix them up and get them rented and even on the tax rolls back at that point. But uh, Lee, it, was, it was good to hear that. Lee, yes, if you could tell the public who you are. And I'm sorry. Let, let them know that you're past president of the Fruitland um, I apologize. City Council. Um, my name's uh, Lee Outen, and I was at uh, one time uh, president of Fruitland City Council. Um, I reside in Wacomico County. The, uh, the other thing is, um, in 2014, Fruitland um, placed an impact on, on uh, our moratorium on impact fees. Um, the, the economy at that time, we had a lot of, of um, development sitting there with empty lots, and um, growth is important to a, a town the size or a city the size of Fruitland. Um, we did recognize that there was a need in those impact fees, but um, our view was uh, half of nothing is nothing. So uh, we were hoping that by, by doing away with those impact fees that we would get some growth and people would start moving in there um, and, and it would help Fruitland grow. So if the, if the county does that, it would mesh with, with what Fruitland's done and um, Fruitland just did extend that. It was a two-year moratorium and I understand that they just extended that for another period of time. So. The two together might do good things for uh, for Fruitland as well. So, that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comments? Seeing none. Council comments. Councilman. Dodd. Yeah, just a couple things. I'm <coughs> thank everyone for um, attending. Um, this coming Saturday, September 24th at noon, we're going to have a bridge dedication for former council member Ed Taylor that's still going on so that's 12 o'clock at Wood Tipkin Bridge um, also I don't know if you all noticed or not but um, this past weekend there were a lot of bikes in town um, Delmarva Bike Week uh, there was projected 170,000 170 175,000 bikers in town and uh, it started Thursday through Sunday and the, the vendors actually came in town Tuesday and uh, it was very busy in this area and there were a lot of things going on as well and uh, I don't think there was any uh, anything negative about it. I haven't heard any complaints, but um, there's a lot going on, and I think that that event is um, huge for this economy. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman Dodd. Councilman Davis. Um, on October the 6th at 6 p.m. at uh, Rivers Edge Apartments, I've been invited to take part in it. It's been presented by uh, Delegate Sheree Sample Hughes. Um, she's invited the sec Secretary Ray from the Governor's Office of Minority Affairs. He's coming down to talk to all anyone that's interested in minority businesses and small businesses, and he's going to bring down the information that can be that the state will lend to help minorities and small businesses just take part. So anyone is interested. Where, where's that going to be again? It's at Rivers Edge. Rivers Edge. Okay. Any other council comments? Councilman Hall. Let me just say, uh, I received a letter the other day from uh, Secretary's, uh, Secretary Grumbles of the uh, of MDE, Maryland Department of Environment, 
and Joe Bartenfelder from MDA, um, asking that I serve on the Maryland Water Quality Trading Advisory Committee. Uh, this committee has been tasked with setting up the nutrient trading program for Maryland. Um, they were afraid we didn't have enough uh, agricultural representation on there. So the committee had already been meeting uh, when they decided this. So um, we're reassembling for four more meetings on the 22nd of September, again in October, November, December, to try to get this uh, manual complete and these, uh, uh, try to advise on how to set up this nutrient trading program for the state. So. I'll be reporting back to the council to let us know what kind of progress you make on that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I, I, I don't think I got that, Matt. You've been asked to serve on this committee. Yes. Well, congratulations. Oh, okay. Maybe. Thank you. <laughs> condolences, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> it could be condolences. Yeah. Some time. <laughs> I don't know about how much. Any other council comments? Under presidential comments, uh, I'd just like to note that uh, this weekend, the, we uh, or I attended the uh, Sharp Town uh, Parade. Councilman Kilmer was there, and I know the executive was there. Is it the Heritage Day Parade? Yes, and uh, a lot of representatives from the state were there as well. Had a great time. I uh, appreciate the uh, hospitality from Mayor Guys now. Uh, it, was a, it was a very wonderful day. I appreciate Enjoyed meeting everybody in, uh, in the Sharp Town area. Uh, that being said, I'd like to entertain a motion from Council to adjourn so that we can go into open work sessions, followed by closed work sessions. So moved. Second. Before I get there, uh, Delegate Carl Anderton has slipped in the room. Glad to have you here. <laughs> we have a motion to second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. Uh, legislative meeting's adjourned. And we'll go into open work session. Uh, first item on the agenda is the uh, uh, county tax sale. I know that uh, Ms. Leslie Lewis is in attendance, or no? She's on her way up? Okay. I know that um, if you could, when we get to it, I'll, I'll let everybody know who you are, please, uh, for, for, uh, for PAC-14. Um, I'll let you start. Go ahead. Okay. I'm yes. Leslie Lewis, Director of Finance. Susan Doherty, County of Finance. Uh, the, um, I think the reason we had you here, because um, several months ago, we would had a discussion in reference to the tax sale cancellation, mm -hmm. and uh, the council was, you know, was somewhat interested in knowing what the uh, motivation was behind canceling the tax sales uh, for the county, which, you know, in, to a certain degree also impacted the municipalities. So we're trying to get more of a clarification as to uh, what the driving force was behind uh, that initiative. And um, cause I was a little bit surprised by this request because on May 18th, I had sent out an email to everyone, being I have a copy to pass out as well, being, um, I thought, very um, specific as to why, mic? I'm sorry, as to why we do not have the tax sale, but I'm always glad to come before you and answer any questions. Uh, I think we need another, there you go. This was your. This was your email. Well, this was really a copy to us from your email, your response to Mayor Wells in Delmar. Am I correct? That is mm -hmm. correct. But it was yeah. very specific as to what thought process went into and why we did not have the tax sale. By law, it's required to have it every two years. We were studying the process and thought maybe that we could do better by skipping a year and putting in-house collection in process um, to date that is working we just ran numbers this morning when as of last week before the mortgage companies were put in we were I believe 3.4 million ahead and Susan has copies we can pass out as of today with the mortgage companies we were ahead of last year at the same time 
Now, is that because you canceled the tax sale, or is it just because we're changing the policy, the measure by which we're addressing these? We're, we're not changing any policy. When you compare year to year, it's it's factual. It's I say not changing the policies. I'm saying you're just taking more a stronger initiative to um, to address the uh, delinquencies. And maybe that is correct. Years. We're trying other methods, <coughs> but. If it does not work, I'll be the first to say it does not work, and we need to have the tax sale every year. But to date, I believe it's working. We have listed the properties on the web that did not sell at tax sale, and that was over 70 percent, no, 60 some percent that people can buy over the counter. And I want to make it clear: when they come in to buy, they have to go through the same process. They have to, you know, wait the six months, go before a judge, and it's not like you can just it's not a quick claim deed, but it is still out there for everyone, anyone and everyone to buy. Um, one thing we're going to start doing in-house that I don't believe has ever been done, as we have time, we're going to maybe write adjoining landowners to let them know that this property is for sale. With me today, I bought a file of the withdrawns, and if, if you want to flip through them, most of them have been withdrawn year after year, so that they're like not doing the county any good. The goal is to get the real estate back on the tax roll and have people to pay, pay the real estate taxes. Questions? So there's properties listed online that are for sale so anybody can come in and buy? Anybody can come so in and buy, but, but be aware, these are the ones that were withdrawn at the 2015 tax sale. You have to go through the whole process. You, know, right. you have to advertise and do everything to and be legal. what is the price on that? what they owe in taxes what they owe in taxes so which right, exactly. okay so and then attorney fees i guess oh absolutely so why are we doing that instead of having an auction on the courthouse uh, steps well we, we don't have the auction on the courthouse we steps. can't do that well it's not done on the court. it's done in this office it's, it's done, done in, this in office. council chambers okay but still what was your question Larry? you're asking why Tax sales take a lot of manpower. We have to get files from every um, town, every city, and you're constantly getting updates because if somebody walks in and pays um, May 25th, you have to take that name off. And, and you, you really want to be very thorough. You don't want to put someone's name in the paper that is paid. So it's a lot of manpower. And now in my office, we're trying to use that manpower in other areas. One example is hotel tax. That's an area that had been one hotel in specific had been past due for years. Since May to date, we've collected between hotel tax and past due real estate on this one taxpayer, $88,000. And that's by simply making phone calls and also sending them a copy of the law. And I have everything I'm talking about today. I will give you a handout. I'll show you the law. I'll show you the taxpayer that paid the 88000 Susan can back up the documents of the number we talked about for collections last year to this year to date. Are people buying these properties for the price that you have listed or are we letting them go for a cheaper price just so that they can get back on the tax rolls? By, by law, I, I have to charge what the taxes are. I so you can't sell it unless they pay that amount? Exactly. Okay. So what you see on, on the web, and I want to try to make this clear to others that are watching, is what was owed as of the 2015 tax sale. So if you're interested in a property, you just need to come in the finance office or call the finance office and we can tell you the new numbers. It has increased. Are there many properties that are for sale that, um, that, are, that they owe more than the property's worth? And yes. what do we do with those properties? That's a good question. That is a decision we need something. I don't know what the law allows us to do, but that is a problem. We've also had um, parcels that have sold a tax sale. The person buys them and is like, I don't want it. And then you just see it. They don't pay taxes on it. are stuck with it. Mm -hmm. I, I thought the standard was auctioning properties off every year. The law is every two years. Every two years. And it used to be every three years. And I, that was in the 90s, I believe it was every three years. But if you have a flow going, it can be every year, sorry. Correct. This, we're just trying, you know, it, it, my email stated, when some, and we see this happen, a lot of the properties are redeemed. When that person comes in to redeem their property, they owe interest, mm -hmm. penalties, 
lawyer fees. It can be, what, $1,600 in addition. It could be a $500 tax bill that is now $2,100. A lot of the buyers are not even local, so it doesn't stay in Wacombe mm -hmm. County. We're hoping if we call these people, we, we now are encouraging people to come in weekly to pay, monthly to pay, at least with the money they don't have to spend to redeem their property. Maybe they'll put it back buying goods in Wacomico County. So we're trying to look at the big picture. We didn't just wake up and think of this. We, we discussed it in detail with staff and other members that have been here for years. Now, a lot of times, I'm sorry, Larry. No, I, I'm, I'm thinking, go ahead. A lot of times we look at what other counties in the state do when we adopt a new policy or go in a new direction. What's other counties in the state do? Does anybody else skip a tax sale every other year? I'm, I'm sure not every county does it. I can. I can. I have not done I just a survey. Said, does yeah. any do? I, I could call and do. Yeah. yeah. Well, we went three years, two years, then someone decided every year. Don't know why the criteria. It's just, that's what they did. So they used to go three years mm -hmm. without having a tax sale at yes. one time. It's mm -hmm. too long. But that was, that was maybe twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. At least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know the time period, but uh, yeah. and, and Susan can tell you as well, there are some ways we can help taxpayers that I don't believe they're aware of, and one is the homeowner credit, which is not for the elderly, it's for your income. There's the uh, veterans, uh, your disabled vet, your full exempt, um, spouse of disabled vet, just trying to let them know, go to the SDAC, go to the website, see what's out there. They can make part payments. Everybody thinks they got to pay the bill in full as soon as it comes. That's what we've been trying to educate. Councilman Kimmel. Well, the, you, know, you say it's been discussed for a while. Um, you know, it seems to have caught a lot of people off guard, though. I mean, the towns, you know, I mean, I, I still get questions. You know, I go to Mardella Springs, went there last month. They're like, what? You know, we haven't gotten any answer on the tax sale issue. Um, you know, you know, we didn't know about it before we read about it in the paper. You know, there was seems to be a lot of surprise about what happened, and you know, the towns, at least that I've talked to, you know, they they were counting on this money, or you know, they they had an expectation that something would be done, and they felt blindsided by it. Um, so, you know, are, are you doing outreach to the towns now to, you know, help? The, you know, Mardella Springs doesn't. You know, they, they they have a very small budget. Any money that comes in from the tax sale is is you know. A, kind of a windfall for them. So, um, you, know, you know, are you working with towns like that to, you know, for their delinquent properties in there to help them out? Because they, you know, when I talk to them, they're, they're still fairly upset about this. No, they did not call or we did not get receive a file for them. And to date, we should have had the file, I believe, by April 1, it might have been March. We received nothing. I have not heard anything from them. And I was trying to look to see actually what they made off the tax sale which is what, Mordella, $6,000 is what they made last year off the tax sale. And that's a lot of money for them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, but I will a tell you, money. when we sell over the counter, they can still make money. If, if it's something that they, someone owed in 2015, if somebody comes and buys over the counter, that money will go back to them. We would have to call them as well and find out what the updated amount is. But they're supposed to turn it into us 60 days prior to us having the tax sale. We got none of this from the counties. It's not our job. Town, from from the city. Towns. 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 And, and no. no one called. No one has Delmar, said it. Delmar never said yeah. it. Not even no. the time that they were supposed to turn it in. They ne the, this email, and I had, <clears throat> even I think in this email states, because this is <clears throat> you're going back to May now, who called, but no one sent anything yet. So they would have been delinquent by the time they had. Well, I wouldn't right, say that email. you would cancel a countywide tax sale just because the municipalities hadn't made a phone call. We didn't. We Normally, there would be open line of communication where you would say, we don't have this information. I mean, if you're planning to do a tax sale and you don't have a response from the municipalities, the first thing that you would have to do would be to contact the municipalities and say, excuse me, but the tax sale is coming. We don't have your, your numbers. I wouldn't say that you would just throw your arms up and say, we haven't heard from any municipalities, so let's cancel it. That's, that's not why we canceled it. Seems and, like and a reverse that, strategy. That's what this email says. No, states. I don't. That's, that, why that's I not don't. why we canceled it. Excuse me? Listen to her. She said that, John. Yeah, I'm it is not. We made, we made a big oh, business decision 
looking at what was best for every taxpayer. Even if it's a taxpayer that makes comes in and pays five dollars or one that pays five hundred thousand. We looked at the whole picture. And I think when you see our year in numbers, everyone will be pleased. Well it could be we're just concerned with the fact that as it initially began, you know, as the letter that you gave us here today, mm -hmm. um, you know, Mayor Wells from Delmar was taken aback by this, was very surprised by this, and, and upset with the fact that they didn't have that, op that opportunity. Well, and another fruit one. Um, I have this written down on my desk. Said she thought this was a good gesture for taxpayers. They're struggling, so why all of a sudden, have, when they come in to pay a $500 bill, should we have to make them pay $2,100? So er you're never going to please everyone. So you have to look at the big picture. I'd be sorry I'm going to say this because at some point in time in my life I might be on that delinquent roll. But you get almost a year to pay your taxes to begin with. By the time they send out the notices, I mean, I, I guess I don't understand keep stretching it out. I, I guess that's what I don't, you know. I mean, you get almost a year to pay your property taxes. and, and They think it needs to be paid in full. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of the homeowners think it needs to be paid in full. If a lot of people can allocate it, uh -huh. that's affordable to them. Yeah. They're on Social Security. Well, that's a, affordable. a note could have been put in the, in the tax bill that it could be paid in a partial payment. I mean, that would have been simple to staple a note on it. I mean, that's, you know. It's never been advertised We're that really way. trying to get out to yeah. people and talk to them, put it on our website. When people yeah. come in, we encourage them to pay what they can, come as mm -hmm. often as they can. Um, and, and like I said, when you see your numbers, yeah. you'll and be I'm, pleased. I'm fine with that. I understand that. In fact, I talked to Pat Peterson about that, and she was totally against it. You know, when we, and she had all her reasons, as you have your reasons That's otherwise. Right, every, but, but I guess my point is, you have a year from the time you get your first notice almost a year. I think it's nine months or ten months to, to pay your taxes. And I guess what you're doing, you're just stretching it out another we we'll try not to let that happen. We yeah. are trying to call people and encourage them as mm -hmm. they come in to pay. And one, when we did, like the people that communicated with us said it is a good idea not to announce it so that people will come in and pay thinking they're going to get ready and be put in the paper. So, and we did have a flood of people coming in like normal. So that's what I'm saying. We make decisions what's best for the whole. Well, I, guess, I guess what I'm thinking now is if we have a tax sale next year and we go back to the two year rotation, mm -hmm. are we going to end up every other year people getting used to that and saying, oh, this is a the year they're not going to have the tax sale, so I don't have to hurry. You know, I don't have to pay right away. So is that going to, is that going to be an issue? Well, I always joke, maybe it's not a funny, but a, a late taxpayer who pays right before the tax sale is my favorite because the county keeps the interest and penalty. Mm -hmm. But when it goes to tax sale, then that person's in trouble. They're going to start paying a lawyer. Um, the interest, 8% to whoever purchased the property. And a lot of them know who's going to redeem. It's almost a business. Mm -hmm. Like they'll buy this brute because they're going to redeem it mm -hmm. before it gets, you know, before it, right. they lose their property. And you can't fault <coughs> them for what they're doing. I'm just trying to do what's best mm -hmm. for the taxpayers. And that's how I try to operate the finance department. Well, what's really best for the all of the taxpayers. That's exactly what Everybody I'm saying. Everybody in the county is for the taxes to get paid on time in a timely manner because that helps get our get our roads fixed and that pays our employees and you know so that's what's really best for all the taxpayers, right? We don't have a cash flow. I, I'm telling you, when you see our year in numbers, you you will be pleased. We Council don't McKillen. have a cash flow problem, and I hope we never do. I guess. I'm confused as to why can't we do a tax sale and do some of these enhanced collection things? I mean, why can't they go hand in hand? You have the tax sale, you know, you publish it on, you know, you publish it, get the people in, and then, you know, also work to collect too. I mean, you know, go hand in hand. You, you know, you have, have the issue of the tax sale, collect the money you can from there, and then work to, you know, you know all the things you've implemented, which would sound fine, but I don't know that, why do they come at the exclusion or at the, uh, yeah, the exclusion of the tax sale? Because I, the point of not having it was try to help the taxpayers not get to the point when they redeem they owe unnecessary money that does not stay in Wacomico County. That is her whole, whole reason. If it doesn't work, then we try. You know, we will go back to annual tax sales. 
but at least I can say I tried to help the taxpayers without harming the taxpayers that pay on time wow. because we do have a hefty fund balance that really makes little to none interest. Well, and, and I understand what you're saying, but again, you're helping the delinquent taxpayers. I mean, you know, and it kind of goes back to Joe's point about, you know, the overall taxpayers, you know, everyone that pays their taxes on time, you know, why are we going through all this special process to help, you know, the very small number? And I think it is a small number. I mean, we've, we've seen a list, right. um, you know, th those, and some of them are habitual, you know, year after year, you know, so why are we going through all this, you know, to, to you know, try to, help a very, very small number of people and not look out for the wider, the wider picture. I, I think that's kind of what, what we're struggling with here. I don't think you, like, I'm not trying to help them. Like, we have so many staff members and there's so many hours of the day. I'm trying to use better, our time better, time management better. If we didn't do the tax sale, I wouldn't have had time to look and call and collect that 88000 <coughs> from that one hotel, which a lot of people were furious over, the tax, the hotels that pay. I heard it over and over again. I think this is the first time in years that they are current. That they wasn't property nothing. taxes, Leslie. That wasn't all property taxes. It was forty. It was fifty thousand real estate, mm -hmm. and real estate personal property, mm -hmm. and it was the thirty-eight room was tax. room tax. Room thirty-eight tax. was room tax, and I believe fifty-two. I want to show you everything because mm -hmm. I don't. I, I'll 50, show you documents 50, to everything I'm saying. Real estate tax came, comes due every year, correct? It was passed still. Yeah, from for a year. It would have gone to tax sale, yeah. but I collected right. it. So it would have been no different than it being collected at tax sale, but I called and made the phone call and collected it. Um, and there's other areas that are being ignored I'm trying to look at. Hotel tax is one, trailer tax is another. But you can't change everything in a day. You try to prioritize what is the biggest dollar amount first and then scale down. They had never rebuilt, and I'm not, a, there had never been a rebuild of personal property tax. You'd get your first bill, and the next thing, what, five years later, you'd get a letter from a lawyer. I don't think that's good for the citizens, because some really did not know they owed, because it's an estimated tax. If you don't send the form in, we estimate a tax. So it could be on our books and not even be a real revenue, because then when they got their, now their bill for the first time, they realized they didn't know this, and they got their filing in. So there, there are, we're not just sitting there. We're trying a lot of different new things for the county. I think I appreciate your efforts, but the, the question I got from one lady is, I pay my taxes on time. I go in and pay them, and why should I pay mine on time when other people don't have to? And, and, and you know, I think she's got a point there. But her point is, she's like me. I don't want to pay interest and penalties. So she right. pays hers on time. She can pay hers late, but she's going to pay interest and penalties. We don't, you know, she can pay them late. I, I, it's, it's no, not she don't want to pay them late. That's not what she was getting at. She was getting at why does she, why should she have to pay hers on time when everybody else doesn't have to? When other people, not everybody, but other people don't have to. It, and if they don't, they, they pay more. They pay more than what she had to pay. I mean, they are punished. Chief if you want to call them punished. Yeah, um, I just want to make it clear that nobody sitting at this table wants to run somebody out of their home and put their house up mm -hmm. for auction. Nobody wants to do that. But there, and I applaud you for calling people and work with them, whether it's a homeowner or a business. But there are vacant properties out there, and we touched right. on that earlier, that have been vacated and abandoned, and they're just sitting there idle, and it's, it, we're not getting anything back from that. What, what's the oldest property or the longest property that's been sitting, not paid? Um, and that's a good Just off question. Top of your head. And, and what you're saying. 1993. Right. 1993. Mm -hmm. that, that is a problem. That is an issue. And that but would the county not bought those properties. So the, it's staying out there so they know it's payable if that ever sells. And that's the process that the sell county. In that's what the process the county has. So what are we going to do with some of those properties that we can sell? And, and that's another issue. I agree with you. A lot in this folder are very old withdrawals that continue to get withdrawn because no one wants them. They're not worth what the taxes are owed. And the people that have been buying at tax sales are not going to buy them because they know no one's going to try to redeem them. Right. I mean, they've done their homework. Mr. Baker, we've asked this question before, I think. What, what do you do with a property like that? Uh, at some, what point in time well, do we have the right to... to get rid of it. I mean, well, it, it, it depends on exactly what the property is. We used to have work closely. Can you get closer to your microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. We used to work closely with the city. Uh, 
we had a deal not too long ago where there was a city on the uh, a piece of property on uh, North Division Street. Somebody wanted to buy it but didn't want to pay both city and county taxes on it. Both jurisdictions lowered the tax rate or the amount of taxes due. Um, other jurisdictions will essentially buy in the property. Um, we did that with um, J. Struve property. Uh, we buy the property in, clean it up, put it on the market, and take the hit for whatever the loss is. So there is a process we can follow? Uh, there, there are a lot of different options you can go through, but it depends. Um, some former people in the finance office um, before Leslie came didn't want to do that. That's why it hasn't been done for a number of years. I wanted the to process is there to do it. Is that a project we can work on in the future? Put these properties back on the tax rolls? That is the goal. That's why, that's exactly right. why. So that's like, can we work on that? Uh, Absolutely. I mean, it, it is a problem. And the tax sale doesn't solve that problem. I know. That, I know. That's, that's what I was, I'm, I'm glad that's exactly what I was, the point I was trying to make. Mr. Rose, you had a comment? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to let you know that. You, you need a mic. Quite a bit of mic. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work in this regard with the finance department. Uh, I issued my last memo on July the 5th. We set up the templates for tracking, actually tracking the uh, collections as they go along. And I, I've got to say, in dealing with, with the finance department, I have seen a total change of culture down there as far as some of the things that Ms. Lewis has talked about as far as, uh, as uh, uh, trying to work with people, uh, customer service, that sort of thing. And I, I, I agree with her that you're going to see uh, some good results and we are tracking it. Great. I wanted to, to go back to Mr. Um, Kilmer's question. It, the, the thought process, Mark, was that um, a tax sale is an expensive proposition. I mean, the advertising alone uh, pushes eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, and and our thinking was, um, we don't really give up anything as a county by not having a tax sale annually, because the meter continues to run. So when we have the tax sale the second year as mandated by by uh, by state law we collect the penalties and we collect the interest the thinking was um, can can we in fact um, collect these delinquent taxes through internal efforts and in doing so avoid some expenses that we thought may be unnecessary and we thought that trying it this first year to determine whether or not it was more efficient to s every other year go through the process ourselves, see how high a rate of collection we could attain, that in fact we may be uh, reducing the costs associated with collecting the delinquent taxes. So that was a thought process. and, and I, I, I believe that the early results here indicate that we probably accomplished that this year. We'll, we'll have to do a post-mortem. Um, but that was the thinking. In terms of delinquent taxes, you know, there are people who can't pay their taxes because they have lost their job. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why you, you, you allow your property uh, to go to tax sale. Um, some people just game the system and we realize that and they game the system because the interest rate that's charged for delinquent taxes is a lower rate than what they can achieve through other investment strategies. Um, not a whole lot you can do about that unless we had the authority to, to really charge uh, a more onerous interest rate that would dissuade people from essentially gaming the system and using the county's money uh, as as working capital on alternative investments. And you know who those people are. You see their names every year. Um, but there are people who, through no fault of their own, just do simply do not have the cash to pay their taxes. So, um, again, um, it was, I think it was a well-intended um, exercise. Uh, we'll see what the results are and determine whether or not it makes sense to replicate it again in two years. 
with that eighty to ninety thousand, does that does that get recouped by the county from you know, I mean, is that money charged back to the property owner for the advertisement? It's, no, it was the, 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 the advertisement. So, yeah. so I mean, if you the advertise, yeah. Costs. So it's not necessarily the candidate doesn't actually lose that money. I mean, it's put out up front, but then it's right. recouped as the process goes along. If the property, if the property sells, sold. if the property sells, and if it doesn't, we pay for it. Okay. We're stuck. So again, with people who are gaming, yeah. who are gaming the system, it doesn't necessarily get get recouped on a timely basis. Who who's in charge of that interest rate? Can we? You know, I by, think that's council mandated by it? state. I don't think state. we can do that ourselves. I think there's a state. Interest rate on tax sales? Yeah, there's. The interest rate on tax sales? Yeah, there's yeah. a state rate. Council. council. Is it? Is it county is council? It? We can mandate it ourselves? Um, on put property, put up a tax sale, or the, the sold the tax sale earns 8% interest. Is there a state usury rate, though, that you can't go through it? Uh, I think Baltimore County is 13%. Is it? So is that how? Okay. Well, well, maybe that's something we should but look at. To Joe's point, if you want to dissuade people who are gaming the system, um, raise the rate to a point where it's not in their best interest to use county's money uh, for alternative investment strategies. And we know that happens. We know that happens. I think we should probably definitely look at that then as no, part of this overall strategy. I, I think part of the issue, though, was that, you know, we had this meeting on May 12th, you know, where we kind of talked about this. Yeah. Um, and I think it was during one of the budget meetings. And, you know, we had said, you know, we'd like more information. And I know there had been repeated contacts with finance, and we hadn't gotten the information. And we wanted the list of people for, you know, from, you know, April 30th and things like that. And, you know, you know we, we appreciate being um, uh, copied on, on the, the letter to Mayor Wells, but... You know, it seemed that, you know, the explanation that we heard was confusing to many of us, you know, me included in that budget meeting, and we were looking for more information, and that just was not forthcoming. And so, you know, we have people ask us about this, and we're not able to give them any sort of coherent answer because, you know, we say we, we haven't gotten an explanation from the executive's, you know, branch either on this. So, um, you know, in terms of the rationale, I mean, you know, it's being explained, you know, much better today, and I understand what you're saying about, you know, maybe we need to try it for a year and see what happens. I mean, I, you know, I, I kind of like that approach. Let, let's see what happens. If not, let's go back and maybe try to tweak more. But, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there, it, for a while, I know there was, you know, I was frustrated. I know others were frustrated that we just weren't getting the answers that we were that we were looking for. So, um, you know, I, I think today has been a fairly, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a little more satisfied now, I think, over what the explanations are now, and it's explained maybe in, in a way um, that I can understand a little bit better than, than we did in the budget meeting, so I appreciate that. But um, I know there's some real frustration and a lot of questions in the public about, about the exact reasons for this. So, um, you know, better communication would, would definitely be helpful in this. You know, and again, look with the municipalities. You know, they, I know that they felt blindsided now. You know, I, maybe they could have reached out to you better. Um, you know, sometimes these municipalities, they're, they, you know, they're, they're struggling to get by just to do what they need to do, you know. I, you know so um, I, I'm, just, I'm saying going forward, that that would probably help with this whole thing. Yeah, I think, um, and um, if I haven't said this before, um, if, if, if you receive questions from the public regarding actions or inactions um, in the executive administration um, feel free to give them my number I'm happy to answer those questions no, I, no seriously I, if if, um, if 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 you feel that you're in an untenable position and you don't have the information to respond to a question that you think needs to be responded to and and it's because of an action or an inaction on our part uh, please refer those people to my office and what I'm passing out now is the summary of the previous tax sale and then the properties that were withdrawn that are now listed on our website. Oh, sure. Oh, plenty. How much of this did we recover? Well, I'm, is that the 449000 No, that that, that that's what was misleading. That is all the cash that is bought in at the, tax, the day of a tax sale. The county recovered 195,000, um, and I'm not going to probably say this, say this right, but the Struve's property was included that we had to buy back at, at I believe, 41,000 as well. Which was based on that demo, 38,000 in okay. demolition. 
so it's not real revenue. It's just we had to buy it back. Mm -hmm. At least we can maybe sell it and get it back on the tax roll. In a letter from uh, Mrs. Wells from mm -hmm. the town of Delmore, she said it was approximately $65,000, um, which I would think would be quite a bit of money to their revenue stream. Um, but she wasn't correct. She wasn't right? Mm -hmm. No. She, I have my ruler. If it's 19000 that's quite a difference. And, and this is factual. This came right out of me. Why did this come up at six? Why? Well, I wonder why she came up with sixty-five thousand. What it may have been is she may have sent in sixty-five thousand dollars worth of debt, but all that sold was nineteen. Just guessing. That's exactly what mm -hmm. happened. And and that's what a lot of I always say numbers speak. You know, people can throw numbers out there, but are they really correct? Mm -hmm. That's why I'm. I try to, when you ask me questions, to respond with a munis report because that's what is audited. And it's no opinion or chart put in it, made it look different. And but can I ask Mr. Baker a question? Ed, is. Is it feasible that your interest rate on past due taxes could be on a sliding scale? Like higher for habitual? Yeah, for, yeah, for instance, so, so and, and again, I go back to the default position that you've got somebody who's lost their job, whatever, they don't have the money to pay their taxes. We want to do, I think, the best we can to protect those people and to be fair with those people, keep them in their homes. Um, with regard to people who, the term I use, gain the system, um, can you can you have a sliding scale on the interest rate um, where it becomes? Yes. yes. I'm uncomfortable with 13% out of the gate yeah. because the guy who lost his job is getting hammered. I'm far more comfortable with the 13% for Mr. I'm going to gain the system. But how do, you, how do you, if you did that on a sliding scale, you would dissuade what Mr. Holloway was describing, people who are just inclined to, well, I'll just not pay my taxes for as long as they let me get away with it. I don't know off the top of my head, but I understand what you're trying to accomplish. Right. Something we take a look at. Okay, thank you. Mr. Baker, it, it, it also might be possible that if a taxpayer can demonstrate a certain level of hardship, such as Mr. Strasburg has uh, referred to having lost uh, employment or something to that effect, that there could be uh, uh, some uh, uh, forgiveness of process of, of at least a portion of that uh, uh, interest rate. Would you look into that as well? Yes. And what I, I just passed out was just um, the actual documents of what was collected that one taxpayer I gave the example of then I the county code and then it was a previous deal that had been made I don't make those deals where they were freezing in interest and penalties I don't feel like I have the authority who made that deal <coughs> you, I'll let you read it I mean not being the last page the last Grouping I sent you uh, there. This one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions or comments? And at any time, this is the stack of withdrawn. If you want to look at the chart, you can even see the first one where it's years of past due. So it's been to numerous tax sales. Just the good thing is this is the stack, so it's not that thick. Small. That's right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Mm -hmm. no thank you. Next time on the agenda is County Roads Paving Projects. Mr. Young. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Weston Young, Public Works Director. Lee Outen, <clears throat> excuse me, Lee Outen, Superintendent of Roads. Good morning. Um, as requested, we've come prepared to talk about our paving program and um, how we decide what roads get to be paved and how we choose the different surface treatment options. Um, I'm not sure if there's any specific questions associated with that, but we'll, we're, we're ready to get into the weeds. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Lee, and he can, uh, I believe we have handouts. So. Yes, I um, apologize for not getting into yesterday. We were having some network issues. Um, the way that I hand these materials out will kind of go in order with it. Um, the first sheet is what I meant to bring during the work session. Somehow that got left. I think we have it. I'm sorry? I think we have it all. Okay. So the, the first sheet basically t discusses our revenue, what our, what our revenues are, what our expenditures are. Um, and then what's, what's important to look at as far as our roads are the different types of roads that we have in the county. Um, page two and, and page three is, well, page three is a chart that's pretty pretty which, helpful. Which um, are you? Of this, this first, this first, first, first page that was on top. Okay. So this, we should be able to work right through this paperwork. Um, out of the 720 some miles of road that we have, we have 346 miles of tar and chip road. Typically, tar and chip road should be treated every six years so that's that's more or less clockwork now on those tar and chip roads there may be areas that there's issues um, um, that we need to do something in addition and there's also work that we need to do to those roads besides cutting shoulders besides patching existing holes that may be in the road or trying to fill in some of the dips there may be other things we need to do, replacing pipes, things like that. We try to do those before we chip. Um, tar and chip is about a dollar sixty-two point five cents per square yard to treat. So it's it's a very economical way to seal our roads. <coughs> tar and chip is not a road fixer. Tar and chip is not a road smoother router. Tar and chip is simply a sealer that protects what's underneath the road. Most of our tar and chip roads have evolved into what they are from dirt roads many many years ago and they aren't necessarily smooth all of them some of them have bumps and dips it doesn't mean they're structurally deficient it just means they're somewhat bumpy um, but we keep those roads sealed with tar and chip every six years so with that if we keep your keep your little chart open and you look at this first big piece of paper here that's stapled together this is a list of all the tar and chip roads slash sections of tar and chip roads in the county. And what I've tried to do is go back in time and compile them into what years they were treated and to project based on that six year cycle when optimally they would be treated again next and when they or they should be treated again next. And to get them back on a six year cycle being the fact that we went for six years roughly with five years roughly with no money for service treatment and none of this getting done. So trying to get us back on a cycle to where we can um, maintain roads like we should so they don't fall apart. So if you, if you look at this big, it's a lot to look at, but it describes the length and the width, the last treatment, the next projected treatment, and more or less what this is doing is by 2021, we'll be back on a six year cycle with our tar and ship roads. Is there any roads on this list that's beyond tar time shipping? Um, it's not going to work for. 
Well, we had one this year. It was an example that we we had to pave, and that was Morris Lunner Road. The edges of Morris Lunner Road were so deteriorated that tar and chip was not an option for that road. There are some sections of roadways that are on here that um, we'll need to have something done in addition to them. This is this isn't what we're doing this year. This is all 346 miles of our tar and chip road, and so so right out of the gate when we have what we're going to do this year. We're going to take a third, a, you know, one sixth of these roads, and and they're going to get done this year. Um, so, when that goes, when that when that list goes out, if there's something that's identified on that list of tar and chip roads for that year that we need to do, we we're going to do it. Um, after the first 12 roads, or no, after the first, I guess, 20 roads, it looks like everything gets alphabetical. Is that right? They're, they're alphabetical according to their treatment year. In other words, these are all broken into different treatment years. So they're going to get... Well, the first 20 aren't in alphabetical order. It seems like they might be listed, I guess, maybe in It, it may have been how they priority. were grouped in that particular year. But, but what I'm saying is, like, if you... Like, how they're coming up... Like, they're, you're probably looking at... On the left-hand side, once you get past Sherwood Circle... It's see. probably just how they were grouped and then and how they were sorted. At some point in time, this, this probably got sorted alphabetically. Um, they're still, you can still look at their treatment years. If you look at the last treatment year, that's going to show you when that road was tar and chipped last. 2001. So you saw so 2001. Davis Road was last treated in 2001. Oh, okay. It should have been treated in 2007, but it's going to be treated this year in 2017. Because if you remember, from 2000 and roughly 2008 to 2014 we didn't do anything so we're catching up mm -hmm. right now and we're trying to get back on cycle last year we were doing roads that were last tar and chipped in 1999 um, some of them a little bit before that so is Davis so, the next road so Davis Road will be on the 2017 tar and chip schedule mm -hmm. so that's this year um, but I mean is it the next one because you have about you have probably 60 on the 2017 next projected they're all getting shipped this year that says next projected 2017. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So let me give you an example of a road that, that let me just glance through here and give you an example. Um, I know that Cannon drives on this list. Some Gares Cannon Drive. Cannon Drive has <laughs> not related. <laughs> it's not related. Not it's just related. one that, that I was looking at earlier. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. you're going to see you're going to see you're going to see Cannon yeah, Drives yeah. also on the hot mix list. Well, I got. Well, I've got a, a guy that lives on Cannon Drive that. Well, yeah. Complains there, about there's it quite a, a bit. there's a tremendous. Same what I'm talking to. There's yes. a tremendous dip on Cannon Drive. Right. Yes. And <laughs> that dip. It's been there forever, but it is a dip. So we, our goal would be to wedge that mm -hmm. and hot mix that that There's stretch where that dip is, and then it's going to get chipped over. There's also a lot of breaking up on that road. Right. And, and being close to the road. So, so you're saying that's going to be fixed because I correct. think all of us have heard from that resident, and yeah, I he mean, has a legitimate complaint. Again, yeah, and it, but again, tar and chip is not a road fixer. No, and it's not. If it wasn't for the county's tar and chip program, our roads would look like a third world country because. So it's they, a sealer, and it does a great job of doing that. So are you taking the dip out, or are you just putting right. tar and chip back? No, on? no, the dip will be will be the wedged will, and okay. leveled with hot mix asphalt. I'm sure he'll be glad to hear that. Right. So you know, we we try as best we can to go through some of these tar and chip roads, and especially now because we we bought a, a piece of equipment called a hot box, where we can go buy hot mix from the plant. It keeps it warm, and right. and our patching crew goes through this list and does the best they can do to fill in dips, especially where old cross the road pipes were and they're rough and, and, and try to smooth those out prior to us tar and chipping them. So tar and chip, you know, that's, that's half of our roads more or less. And they're bumpy rural roads. If there's ever a desire to say we want to improve, you know, this road, then then great, we're gonna do that, but we also are gonna have to widen it. We're also gonna have to go through just like we did on Morse Lunder Road. It gets a lot of traffic. There was a lot of crash history on that road. Um, one of the areas we had money to the other year to fix a curve on that road, but not the whole thing. We replaced all the cross the road pipes. We did some drainage improvements. So we probably spent $200,000 on that road. And if you say $200,000 out of a, a $3 million or $4 million budget, that's a big chunk of it when we have 700 miles of road to deal with. And so it was only a mile and a half of road also. 
So, so that's that kind of is the tar and shim. And you know, my goal would be if if kind of what I'm trying to work towards that that we may have money every year to take a tar and ship road and improve it. But every time we take a road off of this list or a mile off of this list and we put it into another list, our maintenance costs have increased dramatically from tar and ship to paving. So, you know, if we could take it off this list that year, fix it with blacktop, and then maintain it in perpetuity with another type of surface treatment like slurry seal or tar and ship, we've smoothed the road out, but it's going to be kept sealed with tar and ship or slurry. So you're telling us what you do. What is it that contractors do? Because I know we had that complaint. Well, and, um, contractors do all of this. The contractors. Well, Except you for said you had the hot uh, box or whatever correct. you called it. So, so with with tar and chip, you know, years ago when we were when we were slapped in the face with the real possibility that we would be looking at a half million dollars a year, and for as far as we could see, to treat roads. Mm -hmm. The only, the only, you know, with, with trying to think of, okay, what are we going to do? I mean, how are we going to keep these roads that everybody uses every day from falling to pieces? So we invested in a chip box, which we used to do years ago. Um, at one point in time, the county was paying less than a dollar a square yard for tar and shipping. They were paying 60 to 80 cents per square yard in tar and ship. Right now, that contracted price is $1.62 and a half. It's gone up tremendously in the last mm -hmm. 10 years, just like paving has. So what we've done is, we in-house do a certain portion of our chipping. We take a geographic region that, that makes it easier for us for mobilization. It's all right there. And we do that to subsidize so we can start catching up on our six-year cycle. And the, the dollars that we save can be applied to the other side, which is blacktop and slurry seal. So we benefit from our in-house tar and chipping. It, it, it helps us to, to get more covered up and sealed. Mm -hmm. That is the only part of of paving, so to speak, or surface treatment that we do in-house. So the rest of it, the biggest portion of tar and ships contracted, slurry seals contracted, hot mix asphalt contracted, other than small patchwork that we do in-house. So, it, um, you know, cold weather's coming up. Is there mm -hmm. um, a, a certain temperature that you can't go on the roads and lay this down? Um, you have to be a, a, above freezing to, to, to pave. And, and generally, we, we would, you know, now for, for tar and shipping, we're going to want 50 and rising. For slurry seal, we're going to want 50 and rising. So when you get to that time of year, we shut it off, mm -hmm. and, and we're going to pick it up in the spring. We don't want to put down um, slurry seal, especially because it's going to take so long for that material to start setting up that right. we're going to have a traffic nightmare waiting for six hours for that to, to get to a point that traffic can go on it. So hot mix can run later into the season. Mm -hmm. I could remember a, a year or two ago, we were paving in December. Well, well, I can remember a year or two ago, the, the plants never even shut down because it was so mild over right. But, But typically speaking, we're going to be able to pave until November, at some point in November. And then we're going to shut it off until March, maybe April. Well, it looks like a lot of work you've got going. It's a tremendous amount of work. And, you know, while we do contract it, there's a tremendous amount of work that we do in-house in relationship to service treatment. We have to cut the shoulders. We have now, which was cut out years ago, we, we figured out trying to how to do it again. We're spraying the weeds on a lot of the tar and ship roads where they're starting to come back in the roads. So we're doing that. We're not doing everything in the county. We don't have the, the staff or the, or the money to spray everything like we used to. But we don't want to pave on top of, on top of grass. That's going to look ridiculous. And it's going to, especially wire grass, it's going to come back through. So how much funding has come back from the state? And the highway user fund. Very little. If, if you Very look at the first bit. page of this, about 10 percent from historical 10 numbers. Of where it yeah. was. We were getting about se almost seven and a half million dollars in 2007, right. dropped to a low of 312 thousand, and we're now we're getting about 626 thousand dollars. Which that's not enough. So the rest of it is 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 being funded through the county. Councilman Holloway asked at the last meeting, um, what what the cumulative impact has been so from 2008 through uh, 2015 uh, I believe the number was 39.5 million dollars is a shortfall from the state in highway user revenue yes. uh, you can estimate that in 2016 it'll be about 6.5 million so we're at 46 million dollars in a cumulative loss um, I think as everyone here knows the governor has tried to yes. to institute a an eight-year um, 
bring back program, if you will, uh, the Senate and the House leadership uh, has um, rejected that. And quite frankly, uh, I, don't, I don't see any real movement there. So from a planning standpoint, we continue to, to, to plan on the basis that that's what we're going to get from the state. Right. We may get, get incrementally back. a little bit more money. But, but I don't think in this political environment we can count on a whole lot more. I understand. Lee, this list is tar and ship, you say? Correct. This, 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 pay, this is all of the tar and ship roads in Wakanaka County, these, three, <coughs> these, these pages. And in going back through, attempting to go back through um, fiscal year budgets and trying to decide exactly, because sometimes they, there would be something on a budget or on a, on a paving schedule that for some reason didn't get paid, but it wouldn't it wouldn't show up. It would still be on the list. So I've been trying to decipher that and get them all compiled. And I call this my tar and chip trip. Is the priority tracking? Is the priority would have been what the ones that have been are in bold? Or they're they're just they're just bold because they've been pasted over and what they were pasted from is bold. So give okay. no attention to if something's bold or or looks okay. a little different. It's right. it's um. So I'm trying to get an idea when, when we get constituents to right. say where. So if you look at next projected, yeah, next yeah. projected. That's okay. that's that's what the plan is I moving you. forward. Good. And if you look at next projected in that column to the right of it, when those two numbers get together, we're back on track. Good. Okay, and that's that's what we want to do is get back on track. And and actually our, our our cost per year for chipping should decrease because we're doing more now to try to try to get back get back up to speed where we lost so many years. Okay. What are these uh what are the larger sheets here? Okay, now this is the this is the difficult part of it. Um, and this is the part that everybody's going to say, well, that road doesn't need anything done to it, or why did they do this road, or why did that? Or I can assure you that there's not a road in the county that's going to get paved or sealed that doesn't need it. Um, there's roughly another, if you look at the, this chart, we have close to 300 miles of hot mix roads, and they're, they're major collector roads, and they are um, minor and local streets, which are subdivisions, which we have 150 subdivisions in this county. and and then we have minor collector roads. So those roads are looked at, and in what we do every day, we're on the road. So we have a pretty good, and, and we have complaints from the public. So we have a pretty good idea of what's going on <coughs> in the roads. So we formulate a list, and we look at, okay, what roads can we save? What roads can we seal at this point? Because the, the biggest list is slurry seal. These are roads that's it's, it's a preventive maintenance tool. It's Which one is slurry seal? It's the big list. It's the two-page one. Okay, so you have the, the one page is hot mix, and the two-page is slurry seal. So whatever roads that we feel that we can that we can save through preventive maintenance, like slurry seal, because it's going to be close to having to spend big money and pave, we're slurrying it. The difference between sealing and paving is two dollars a square yard versus thirteen to fourteen dollars a square yard. It's astronomical. The lifespan of slurry seal is eight to ten years, and the cost of hot mix is about fifteen years. You can't go by you can't go by time to to the T with hot mix asphalt. And, I, and there's some pictures that, that I have attached that, that are going to give you some examples of of kind of what we're looking at. The first road is Zion Road. This road was paved in 2005. It's been 11 years. As you can see, you're starting to see some surface cracks in it, and you're starting to see the color to lighten. That means it's, the road is oxidizing. This is the time to seal this road because we are going to save a ton of money by sealing it now. I don't see on these lists of projected dates. There's, because we don't, we're not projecting dates for this yet. <clears throat> Eventually, the idea would be once we slurry these roads, mm -hmm. just as we've done with the tar and chip tracking, Cycle. we're going to have a slurry tracking. So it's going to be 10 years in a subdivision. We're going to seal it again. It gives us a very good snapshot moving forward of what we're, we're, our budget needs are going to be. Well, well, on this list here, you've mm -hmm. got the name, the road name, then you've got subdivision. Right. Okay, but in the subdivision area, a lot of places you've just got like three paths, like Johnson Road, three patches west of. That's kind of a that's kind of a comment just, box. Just a it's a it's an so, internal comment box. Okay. It's for us for for our own internal needs. For, okay. You know. So if someone asks us tomorrow, 
uh, what road is going to be hot mixed or what road is going to be uh, treated with slurry seal, what do, we, what do we tell them? This this list is going to be hot mix asphalt. It's this single page. So this one. isn't a complete list of all the hot mix and slurry roads in the county. Uh, this is just what's going to be done. This is what is going to be done this year. Oh, okay. This year. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm this sorry. is what's on the agenda. Uh, yeah, this, this is this is year's this is this year's paper, which is still fluid to agree. For instance, we were able to pay Wesley Drive and the section of Quantico Creek Road this past fiscal year, so it's being moved off. It's not going to be done. done this year. That's correct. What was the yellow? Disregard. They're yellow, or again, yellow. Um, Lower. Yellow is kind of hopes and dreams. Normally <laughs> speaking, we're going to have some monies left over at the end of the fiscal year. Or we're going to be able to save a so lot of So that's a low priority. A, no, it's not a low priority necessarily, but it's something that, mm -hmm. that we would like to do that, that you know, Longo Road doesn't get a lot of traffic, but it's rougher than the Cobb, and it's really yes. bad. We really want to do that if, if through cost-saving measures, we can have the funding to do that, we want to do it. So, again, they're internal. They're so internal it's a list needs. of what's going to get done, except for the ones highlighted in yellow. Those are maybe the, the ones highlight, like for instance, um, some of these Glastonbury, Thornberry. If, if I'm going to have to end up cutting a road, like it says HMA, can wait till next year, I may have to let that one go. So, if, John Cannon Drive's going to get fixed. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell that fellow that, right? Yeah. So, but they're, they're more for our own internal yeah. purposes. Okay. Um, Yeah, try to figure out what as to as mentioned during budget and other other council meetings, our our intention is very similar to this tar and chip list: is to put all our roads, all the proposed surface treatment years, on the website so that somebody can look or um, to try to be as transparent. Um, of course, things change. Some roads will oxidize faster than others, or we'll have geotechnical issues or weather effects, the freeze thaw. So the the list is evolving at times, but we, we have a pretty good idea of where we where they should be. A lot a lot can change in these. I mean, over this winter, we may have a road that just for some reason decides to go through a, a freeze thaw cycle and becomes a major priority in the spring. So we're going to have to kick something off of this list if it can wait. You're so right. it's fluid. So and, I mean, so now you're saying it's not going to get fixed. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying that. It's too early to say that. And just like on the slurry schedule, you know. We are aiming to try to save things while we can. Is it possible after this winter there might be something on this list that we say, I don't really want to slur it because it's kind of gone now, or the, the winter was too rough on it. It may come off of that list. So it's fluid to that degree. Um, so, but if you look at, say, Z Zion Road, 2005, that picture, that is an excellent road for us to, to slurry right now and save a ton of money. Because if you look at Zion Road on the slurry schedule, it has on there what it's going to cost us to slurry it and what it will cost us to pave it. I mean, we're, it's, you know, 300 so and some odd thousand years. dollars versus $70,000. So it's lasted 10 years since the last time you did something. Right. Like it. And it's a black top road. It's lasted 10, 11 years. So we're going to be able to slurry that road and probably get eight out of it. So if you look at your dollar cost, slurry seal and tar and chips the way to go from a life cycle standpoint to what you're spending. It's not as smooth and people don't like it as much, but in terms of keeping the roads going, it's, it's, it's the thing to do. I mean, people don't pave their driveways every time they, they, they seal them. They go out there and they seal their driveways. They don't pave them every time they start getting a little rowdy looking. Well, and the roughness wears down as more traffic's on it. And the heat, yeah, the, it, it, takes, it takes long, it takes a bit, but um, it does smooth out over time. The next page of picture is a good example of why you can't go by time. This is, this is Heather Glenn Drive. Heather Glenn Drive, uh, Heather Glenn Subdivision was built in 1999, <coughs> 1998. This road was brand new then. In 2007, the main road had to be paved again because mm -hmm. it was falling apart. And here we are at 2016, and there it is. I mean, it's, this, it's not lasting. Was it's, that a poor mix? It's, it's either more than likely a subgrade issue or, or the, the, the county standard at that time was three inches of stone and two inches of hot mix, which uh, on that type of soil is not enough. Yeah. So, so the, the standards have gotten more stringent with mm -hmm. subdivision roads and with the three-year maintenance period. We can see if there's subgrade issues and try to correct it within that three-year period. But some of the older subdivisions, we have to go back. Um, when we have relayed hot mix, we've added uh, geotextile fabric to help assist um, with the, to, to avoid these issues. 
I mean, if you and if you go to the next picture, there's Morris Road. That's where Salisbury Middle School is. That road is horrendous. It's needed something done to it for years, and it's been on the schedule for years. It's on the schedule this year. That's it. Actually, it's a tar and chip road, mm -hmm. and it is in, in very bad condition. So we plan on fixing that road this year. Um, Good. I had someone call me about it. The next picture is Dagsboro Road, paved in 2006. Ten years. It is turning white and cracking. We're going to slurry that this year. It's going to save a lot of money to take care of it now. Now the other, the other, the next picture is something I really want you to see, and this is this is this is Jersey Road between Robinson Street and Naylor Mill Road. This road was was reconstructed in 2002. The county used state aid money for it at that time. I'm talking about completely built. Um, so that road's 14 years old and it's fallen to pieces. A lot of this is, you know, starts as oxidation. The sun beats on it. Mm -hmm. You lose your, your binders. The stone starts coming off, and then it cycles into what you see here. So are you past slurry? We're seal? past on that. It's gone. So we're going to have to spend two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on this stretch of road to fix it. I wouldn't be comfortable to try for this road to go through another winter, or we're going to be at a, a situation where we're going to have liability issues. Right. So the next page, if you look at it, is the same road. That's Jersey Road. That road was paved in 2007. Mm -hmm. That's five years difference in those two surface treatments. The picture is really not good, but it's starting to turn white. So to me, as far as trying to be fiscally responsible, we should seal that road now so it doesn't look like the page before it in five years. They're the same road, just paved at different times. So that's what we're going to do. And, and it's going to save us a ton of money. Um, and it's going to allow us to do things in the future with other roads, maybe our bumpy tar and chip roads that people don't like, and start paying a little more attention to them once we catch up and get some of these big problems behind us. So, so Weston, the main issue I see here is that uh, your revenues are $6.3 million. And your total expenses are 6.95 million. So, what are what are we going to do about well, that? Well, this uh, this total does not does not take into account the slurry seal that we're doing. So, okay. yeah, yeah, that, that's something to note. Um, so, this is if we are purely doing hot mix asphalt everywhere. Right. So, by and tar and chip. And yeah, mm -hmm. and tar and chip. Well, the tar and chips built into this, but but slurry seal is not built in because historically in the county we did some amount of slurry seal but not the amount we're doing now so this will go down if you change some of this to the we can hit seal. more roads but again it's it's all about the conditions about whether or not it, it's a slurry seal is applicable for the condition of the road but will your 6.3 actually cover well on the projections if you look at if you look at the slurry seal paper at the bottom it tabulates the miles of treatment that we're doing it gives you a total dollar amount for the slurry seal and if we had done those roads in hot mix asphalt, what that number would have been. So for slurry seal, we're spending $1.1 million roughly. If we were to pay those with hot mix, we would have spent $5.6 million. Right. So that, that number starts getting towards this number here at the bottom. We're just, we're just covering more, you know, the miles of road with a different type of treatment that's cheaper. I think what we'll do is wrap it up. We appreciate that. Uh, do you have these electronic files? We can, we can send them. If you don't mind. Yep. And uh, then uh, I mean, it's a good discussion to have. It's important uh, for all the constituents. Uh, well, maybe we can have you guys back if, we, if the council still has questions. One question. Uh -huh. Go ahead. How are you making out with your contractors? Why don't you take that lesson? Joe, I was trying to finish this thing. Um, our, um, <laughs> we had difficulty with our hot mix asphalt this year. Uh -huh. um, we had to give two one month extensions. Um, typically work is supposed to wrap up within the fiscal year. Uh, so end of June, but we had to push it into July and August. Um, we got everything done that we requested, but it was, um, it, it was, it was difficult. Mm -hmm. It was difficult. Um, there were other municipalities, Ocean City, Crisfield, mm -hmm. to name a few that were given priority over us. And, um, does there need to be a change in our bidding process um, yes. to allow us to use more than one one um, contractor or um, refuse one if they're not doing 
what they should be doing in the past as far as history goes? Or? We, we're, we're, we're looking into that. I think a vendor review mm -hmm. at the end of, end of a project would be good just mm -hmm. to, for, for the project manager, or in this case, Lee, who's, who's mm -hmm. managing the roads, um, could then write the pros and the cons mm -hmm. of that vendor and then use that in consideration of future bids. Mm -hmm. If they do great work and they seem to work well with the county, that could possibly give them a bump uh, to, to be used again. Um, cost considerations, of course, uh, as a primary focus. Um, on the flip side, if the vendor has a poor review and we get lots of citizen complaints, which we had with Hot Mix Asphalt mm -hmm. this year, and um, other issues, we could then use that mm -hmm. to, to then go with maybe the second lowest bidder. Um, part of it's also for the for the taking two extra months. Uh, it's the capacity of the company to to perform the work. Right. Um, some firms out there will bring in additional crews if we give them additional work, mm -hmm. or they can wrap things up faster by bringing in multiple crews. Um, it did not seem like our chosen vendor was able to do that. So, so sometimes not. The lowest price isn't the best price, I guess. Yeah, I think, right um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ideally, uh, going with the concept of best value, yeah. um, bang for the buck, quality, um, sometimes a, paying a bit more will give you three times the, the lifespan right. of what the original yeah. um, deal is. So, um, yeah, it's, it's something we're going to definitely uh, look into just, just from a timeliness factor. I know I've heard some complaints about the current vendor, so. Okay. Well, Thank I mean, it puts everything behind, I'm sorry. It puts everything behind, like if, you know, we're waiting to see what's gonna get completed mm -hmm. and we need to put out a bid for this coming fiscal year. We need to know, do we need to take something off last year's and put it on this year's or what we're gonna bid out, is it gonna get done? So it's, it, it kind of messes up the whole process and delays us and what we need to do moving forward. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Anyway, thank, thank you. you. Thank Mr. you. Mr. President, I won't, I won't delay us anymore by uh, talking about Barron Creek Roads, but uh, no, no, it's not really pertinent there, but uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I know there's been some talk about that, so if we could talk about that at some point, but it's not, I know it's not okay. totally pertinent here, but we can talk for hours on that problem. Yes. We're, we're actually working on a summary for you. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Next you item on the agenda, the uh, Salisbury Wacomico Enterprise Zone, and we have Ms. Lori Carter here. <coughs> Laura Kurchkowski. Yeah. Good morning. I'm also going to ask Mr. Ryan to come forward and also Mr. Frank McKenzie from our department. He's going to get the maps. Great. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We're here to discuss the proposed expansion of the Enterprise Zone to include the airport. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Kardakowski, I have that problem with that word too, um, who's the business development specialist and also the enterprise zone administrator at this time. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I'll give you guys just a little background on uh, why we're approaching council with this. Um, Lyle Hogue, the Piedmont Airlines president, had approached the county executive with the idea of expanding the enterprise zone to include the airport. Um, as the city's the enterprise zone administrator, we would file the application in tandem with the county. So uh, after some discussions with the Maryland Department of Commerce, planning and zoning determined um, an eligible avenue that could work to expand to include the airport. Uh, and we started meeting to uh, get ready, get our application ready. So um, that is why we're here today. And if we have any questions, just let me know. What about uh, across the road, across Airport Road? I know at one time there was a proposed uh, business park over there. Is that still zoned for commercial usage, and, and would it make any sense to include that in the enterprise zone? Uh, uh, to, to far, far as my knowledge, it's not in a PFA, and I think you need to be in a PFA okay. for the enterprise zone. Yeah, well, correct. it's noted it, it's in a common area. In a common area, it says it's not eligible. But what the heck is a comment area? If I could address that. Could you comment? <laughs> <laughs> if I could comment on the comment. Um, when the state of Maryland created the law for the uh, uh, priority funding, uh, they set up some criteria as to what could qualify for areas where the state wanted to focus some of the state funds that would be requested by a business or a local government. And um, part of it had to do with um, 
You know, if it was an enterprise zone, it automatically qualified. If it had certain residential densities, it automatically qualified. Uh, certain industrial zones, they were zoned as of 1997. Uh, they qualified to be an enterprise zone um, or in a private funding area. Um, the state requested that the counties go through and designate which areas they wanted to, to be set up as a priority funding area. And the county did that, and then the Maryland Department of Planning would uh, look at our request and make comments. And the comments had to do with, well, we believe that this area did qualify, but didn't meet certain um, criteria, uh, for instance, uh, for sewer and water application. If it didn't have sewer and water, or it wasn't planned for sewer and water, that it could not qualify as a priority funding area. And that was the case with the area next to the airport. So it's not on that map, but on the, the handout. It should be included in the packet. Oh, priority funding area. Mm -hmm. But with it, with it adjacent to the airport, this, this priority funding area, I mean, it is adjacent. Correct. It is adjacent. Yeah. But what we're, uh, our next step will be to update our sewer and water plan to have this uh, be in at least a 10-year plan uh, for sewer and water. And at that point, um, we can then resubmit to the Maryland Department of Planning to have our map updated and certified as compliant with the priority funding law. How long, what's the process in that, how long? Well, um, we had to go through the sewer and water plan that could take 90 days. Um, and that's you know, working with Public Works to see what their schedule would be. Uh, then once that's approved, then we can go back and could apply to the uh, Maryland Department of Commerce for an, an upgrade to our, or an update to our enterprise zone. And that could, they accept applications twice a year in April and in October. So we could, if we could get this done by April, we could uh, see you again in, in, in April Correct. for an update. If you can get it done by April or by October? By April. We'll, we'll get it done for this, this month, mm -hmm. for, for October, we, uh, possibly for April. Yeah, that'd be good with. because I thought it was such a, uh, you know, they were taking such a massive step forward to try to create that and it just went nowhere. It seems like if there's any, any area that needs incentive that would be right there, I mean, that would enhance the airport greatly. It's, it's a great spot. Yeah. It's, and, but sewer and water would be the driving uh, economic factor there. Mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so where, uh, where do we go from here then? Um, from here, we uh, forward this to uh, County Council public hearing, which I think we had scheduled for potentially October 4th. Um, have public come out, and if that's all good and well, we'll file the application and submit it to the Department of Commerce. Okay. All right. And Mrs. Hurley says it is on the October 4th. Right. Um, I have ever prepared that public notice. Are you guys going to take care of that? Yes. Okay. Any other questions uh, from council? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, the comprehensive plan, uh, chapter six. We're gonna eat lunch. We'll Joe, right Joe, you had that question that you wanted to ask that took us <laughs> way beyond our oh, limits. Come on, man. We have the board of education at one o'clock. Yes. <coughs> Good try. Good afternoon, uh, council members. Good afternoon. Uh, Keith Hall, Planning and Zoning. Uh, Jack Lennox, Planning Director. Um, where we left off last time in the continuing discussion of the comprehensive plan was on the agricultural chapter, chapter six. Um, mm -hmm. Just to give you a few recap or highlight of where we were at, we kind of went over the basic structure of the chapter, the type of information that you would find in it, which would include information about preservation programs, 
uh, as well as farming assistance programs, existing legislative um, <clears throat> legislation that's directed towards preserving farming operations, and trying to um, reduce incompatibility with that and other land covers and land uses. Uh, uh, as we went forward from that discussion, we talked about another major component of this chapter. While this chapter is important, it highlights many things about the ag as far as the economy goes, characteristics, job creation, the importance to sustain the industry, and what type of policies we could look at in the future to help preserve it. Um, the other component of this chapter, which is equally as important, is regarding the, what's known as the priority preservation area. Um, which is a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it the preservation area as we move forward. Mm -hmm. What that really comes down to is the state enacted certain planning laws back in 2006 regarding a county's um, ag certified program, which is a state certified program. And in order to be a state certified county land preservation program, you have to have certain requirements met in your comprehensive plan. One of them is called this priority preservation area assessment or analysis. That's the second component that you'll see in this chapter that's very important. Why is it important? Um, back in 2008, again, just to give you a little bit of history, the county was certified or had a state certified county land preservation program up until that time, at which time the state felt that the county's ag zoning was too permissive or not restrictive enough, and we did not receive recertification. <coughs> At this point, as the plan has been reviewed by the Planning Commission and forwarded to the Council for their review and consideration, it was the intention of the Planning Commission and staff recommended that we look at incorporating a priority preservation area element into this chapter so that we could at least entertain a thought at the Council level of whether or not we should seek to um, seek recertification of our county land preservation program. So therefore, it's an important first step to get that discussion going with the state. Um, the, pro the priority area is a very simple assessment. It's based on state requirements. You identify an area of interest that you want your preservation to be prioritized. Um, for the purpose of this discussion, the maps that have been handed out in front of you are what's in the draft 2016 comp plan. Um, the area that's illustrated in the light green color is what's being proposed the, as the priority preservation area element or the priority area. Um, it contains approximately yellow screen. Yellow screen. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It contains see? approximately the- What do you see green? <laughs> I'm sorry, yellow please. Um, so the yellow indicates what's being designated or proposed as the priority area. It's almost the entirety of the A1 zoning district, with exception of a little slice of the A1 zoning district that's um, inside the Metro Core, over by West Road, just happens to be. And you'll notice the other areas are not designated for this um, preservation program. So we got to be careful moving forward of, um, as we discussed last time, how do we define what to do with the growth areas, especially given the conversations that recently have taken place with poultry? Um, ag is permitted in designated growth areas, which are also shown on your map. Um, it's pink. It's pink or lavender. <laughs> Green. <laughs> and um, at, the last, at our last discussion, there was some uncertainties that we needed clarification from both the Maryland Department of Planning of how this preservation area map interacts with our proposed draft growth tier map, as well as the expressed interest to go out and talk to some stakeholders and get their input, or at least find out what their thoughts are of how to proceed of whether or not to include these designated growth areas, uh, also being referred to as transition areas into this program area. Um, Keith. Yes. Um, talk about the growth areas, and I'm looking at this map here, and I look at areas like Powellville and down Nanticoke Road that doesn't have a municipality. How did we pick those areas to be designated growth? Um, that, that is based off your zoning and your current land use plan. Um, so the so last how time- How that designated though? They're, they're known as our rural villages. Because there are developments already there. And Absolutely. Okay. Historic, so there was a historic development pattern that was there. I think the same applies when you look at um, rural villages such as Allen, Whitehaven, Nanticoke. Well, well, Whitehaven, is that what I'm looking at on the um, water there on the Nanticoke? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. 
Well, not on the Nanticoke. Um, no, that's going to be more Nanticoke, Jesterville, Bivalve okay. area. Again, rural villages yes. uh, where, <coughs> where you've seen historic growth and uh, existing development. So I, I'm sorry, um, going back to where we were at. So what we've looked at is um, we went out, we've worked with the community, we've got their input. And the question really at hand was, do we include these designated growth areas or these transition areas into what's known as the preservation area? Um, overwhelmingly, the consensus was that we do not do it because of what the unintended consequences are. It's great that we give farmers and rural property owners every opportunity or flexibility to do with their property uh, as they see fit. However, by designating the area, for example, that everybody's familiar with between Willards and Pittsville, which is known as a designated growth area, if we hypothetically included that in the yellow area, then you've got the relationship with the tier map. And inadvertently, we've created a restriction on residential subdivision that those property owners did not have prior to that action. I don't think we were talking about eliminating the designated growth areas, mm -hmm. but seeing whether or not there's a feeling that their designated growth areas needed to be reduced, whether they were sort of not arbitrarily, but somewhat arbitrarily placed. And to a greater extent, I, I, I'm assuming the designated growth area was probably established when we were more in a boom era. That's the last time it was revised as part right. of the 2004 zoning, which things was a different market. Things settled down a lot. So I'm wondering if things having settled down some, whether it's important to recognize that and to reduce the size of the designated growth area. I think that's a consideration we can discuss as we get on to the last chapter of the land use chapter. Right. And um, that's going to be a consideration of the council of whether or not there's a discussion about potentially changing the use to a more restrictive, uh, um, more restrictive use or yeah, more restrictive, which would lend itself to a down zoning as it got implemented through the zoning code. So that is one area, as the comprehensive plan was drafted by the Planning and Zoning Commission, they were very sensitive not to um, arbitrarily or even go after the, the thought process of looking at down zoning as a potential option. Can you, um, can you tell me, this is a big, I'll make it really clear. Uh, if you have a piece of property that is in right now, that is in the designated growth area, mm -hmm. and the county were to say, well, you know, we're going to reduce the designated growth area, growth area. you're now in a priority preservation area, what are the pros and cons? Because you said unintended consequences. What are the pros and cons of having of doing that? Well, the first the one I'm going to look at is the first action is, is you're going to take a property, given your example, and you would down zone it from town transition, hypothetically. What are, what are the pros right now resource. of it being in the designated growth area and what changes? Okay, the pros of it being in the designated growth area right now is it gives the rural property owner the availability to develop if they were if they sought to, mm -hmm. at a higher density residential development than they would if they were in the county. Okay. In addition, it offers some limited commercial activity that they would not have in the industrial mm -hmm. zone district unless it was ag related. Okay. So it does give them an expanded um, a set of uses that they would not have if they went to a more restrictive zoning district. Okay. And so if you, if you made it a priority preservation area, what happens? If I take that property between Willard's in Pittsville, for example, Maybe. that is zone town transition, and I put that in a priority preservation area element. Mm -hmm. The bad side of it, or the negative or adverse effect, is <coughs> the relationship to the tier map. And I'm sorry these all are getting commingled, mm -hmm. but that's the connections that we're looking at under this planning environment or framework. So you're going to have a property that's designated for residential growth or limited commercial growth. Mm -hmm. And we're essentially going to cap them out at not being able to ask for any more than seven residential lots as a function of subdivision. Well, if they have more than hypothetically four to six acres and they can meet the perks and other applicable rules, regulations, and policies in certain circumstances, they're going to be able to achieve a lot more than that. So we're putting a, a restriction on them. Um, Is there any it, positive side to it? The positive side, um, it's, it's hard to find it. Again, it's removing flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really cornering or, or putting rural property owners in a corner to where they don't have as many alternatives okay. as they'd like to have. Okay. Um, the only downside of not being included 
looking at this conversely in a priority preservation area, is that as you get evaluated on your checklist for your mouth easement or your state easement, that's one checkbox that won't be checked. However, that's not gonna be the end all. Um, we, it has been confirmed that the state Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Foundation does purchase easements inside of designated growth areas. So it doesn't automatically preclude you from having that same option as if you were in the area. So essentially it comes down to two core questions that staff is seeking a direction from the council. Collectively, is there a consensus amongst the council to go about creating or endorsing a priority preservation area within your comprehensive plan? The second one is, do you concur with the assessment as proposed that the priority preservation area would be overwhelmingly the majority of the A1 zoning district? I think once we have direction on that, that gives us a good indication of how to proceed forward with going ahead and having the state review our growth tier map because then we're finding all the consistency that we're looking for. Well, I think you, the last time we met, you talked about the flexibility that was also going to be incorporated. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's not a hard and fast decision. It's a decision right. that, hey, let's, let's move forward and get it done. And, uh, you, you know, you've incorporated some, enough flexibilities that we can Mm -hmm. change if we have to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Keith. If you, uh, if you have a piece of property that's <clears throat> in Tier 4 and in the priority preservation area and you exercise your ability to transfer from Tier 4 to Tier 3 by proving that you can develop more than seven lots by the health department, does that automatically take you out of the priority preservation area? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so and, the re and the reason that being, great question, is it goes back to the legislation of the, of the septic bill. Right. If you are in a preservation area, the law states you must be Tier 4. Right. So if you move from a Tier 4 to a Tier 3 based on the caveats that we've discussed, right. then the next administrative modification to the comp plan would be to uh, effectively remove you from the priority preservation area. Okay. And that would be handled administratively. Yep. And someone would have to go, you say handled administratively, so somebody would just simply have to walk into the government office building and make that request? Is that good at planning and zoning? I think, as, I think as we work through that process right now, the one recommendation that I would um, consider the strongest for your consideration is that as the action to move from a Tier 4 to a Tier 3 occurs, mm -hmm. which is, remember, a function of the Planning Commission mm -hmm. and the Health Department, then concurrently upon the approval of that action, you would be removed from the preservation area. So it does have to go through a formal process with the Planning Commission? Health yeah, it's, it's preliminary. It's preliminary okay. plan approval. Mm -hmm. uh, does it have to be contiguous? Ideally, the preservation area should be contiguous, but there's nothing that states in law that it has to be contiguous, unlike the priority funding area discussion. And the inter well, I'm sorry, the enterprise zone discussion enterprise, yeah. you just had. Right. So there is some more flexibility. And it ultimately goes back to what the program criteria is at the state level. So we, again, to try to afford the most flexibility possible to the rural property owners, everyone almost in the A1 has been included within this yellow area, preservation area. However, there are going to be some properties based off soil types and conditions, size, that won't be eligible. But instead of having a buckshot looking map, we tried to have something that had some type of um, continuity to it. Okay. And especially as you start, again, overlaying all the other pieces, the land use, the zoning, the growth tier map. We're searching for that consistent, consistency to make sure we don't create any incompatibility amongst these documents. In the uh, section under land use management with the agricultural zoning, you make the comment that um, that um, the density reflects the, um, the, the 98 amendment referencing one unit per 15, one per three with a cluster provision and all that. Does that contradict what you said in the introduction about the minor subdivision being s seven lots? There's no contradiction to that whatsoever. It's just, again, the new planning framework since 2006. John, closer to the mic, please. Okay. It's, it, it's a moot point based on what oh, you I said. Understand. Thanks. <laughs> I can hear it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, good. 
Uh, again, that's where our staff's available to answer any questions you may have about either any part of this chapter, any part of the previous chapters, how they connect together. Um, we are seeking some type of direction moving forward. If there are considerations of amending this, I think right now is a good time or prior to getting to the next chapter is a good time to have those conversations. Um, any, any comments at all? I know we've had some concern from some of the property owners and some of the towns about the poultry being close to um, mm -hmm. close to the towns. Mm -hmm. Is that is this the proper place to address this? Not particularly. Okay. Sounds good. Nothing that Keith has just described to you constrains you either way. Okay with that and I know that discussion will take place moving forward that's fine right. and we have one chapter left is that correct, that correct? most extensive land use land use chapter seven mm -hmm. okay um, any other questions from anyone mm -mm. all right Jim thank you very much thank you, thank you as we're always getting, we're getting close oh yeah very much. Yes, so thank we'll you. have it's it we'll have it in no time <laughs> sure. thank you all. Then we'll do it again after that. At this time, we'll take a 45-minute recess for lunch. When we come back, we'll be visiting at 1 o'clock with the Board of Education. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye.